Hello guys. Welcome to a new story and a new voice. Tell me what you think of the new voice in the comments so I know either to keep it or bring back the old one. Today I being you part 2 of what if Deku was musing. I hope you enjoy. If you do please remember to subscribe and like for more videos. I did not write this story. The original writer is Deathly Jazz Hands 55. Please support them. Now let us dive into the story. Heavy breathing echoed throughout an alleyway as the moon shone down from the night sky. It was 8.35 p.m. on a Monday, meaning it was a school night for most kids in the area. Most kids were also at home after dark. But not this particular teenager. Her long brown hair flew behind her as her school uniform belonging to Mizutafu Private Middle School blew from every angle that it hadn't been kept down by corners of her shirt lifting and blowing back as she ran. Her skirt followed in the same motion as her hair, rising up just enough for her thighs to have been visible, and nothing more. Her dark auburn eyes were wide in panic, brimming with tears as she rounded a corner. The alleyways connecting the city had been like a maze, so she was considerably lost. This wasn't even to mention the fact that this had been her first time down them. It was a bad time to be in as much trouble as she had been, but who could have blamed her? She watched her friend of two years walk down an alleyway with some random gangster-looking guy and watched her purchase Trigger. How could she not be curious to see who it was? Trigger was a highly illegal drug. It was used to power up quirks and boosted people's senses. The side effects were migraines and instant addiction, among other things. Now, she was no snitch. But for something like that, and in her neighborhood, she had to tell her dad. But seeing as she had been caught watching the trade go down, that could have only meant one thing was about to happen. If she didn't hightail it the hell out of there, she could be seeing the opposite end of a gun barrel. She felt something yank on the end of her hair, making her trip up on her footing, sending her falling to the floor, face first into the pavement. The brunette grunted, trying to get up, only to be grabbed by the back of her shirt collar. Well, well, well. Look you what we got here. A gruff-sounding voice hissed, turning her to face the man responsible for dealing out the drug to her former best friend. If she made it out of this, she wasn't going to associate with them anymore. Her father wouldn't approve of it, and her own morals wouldn't allow her to. That was if she made it out of this, that is. The man in question was tall, maybe six feet on a good day. He was big, too. His body was rotund, and his eyes looked more like wolf's eyes. He also had two large wolf ears protruding out of the top of his head, as well as a wolf's snout. In fact, if she hadn't known any better, she'd say that he had some sort of wolf-like mutation quirk. Oh, let me go. The girl cried grabbing at the man's wrist, scratching with her nails as the man laughed. She kept struggling, only for the man to continue to laugh at her attempts to break free. Oh please, brat. You don't think I don't know who you are? The wolfman snarled, his jaws inches away from her face as she gulped. You're Mikan Tsukachi. You're the daughter of that nosy detective. If I let you go, you're going to tell your father. And then what? Get me arrested. Like hell, I'll let you go. Now, be a good little girl and stop struggling. I want to teach your father a lesson, and I know the best way to do that. His hand reached out for the brunette's skirt, her eyes widening. He's going to rape and kill me. No. I have to. Something heavy hit the side of her head, and in one moment, she lost consciousness. In the next moment, she was laying on something soft, but also something wet. She felt something shake her shoulder, and when she came to, she saw a hand pull away from her. Immediately, she sat up, ready to fight, only to see a boy around her age back away defensively. Whoa! No need to get hostile, the teen said, his voice calm. The boy was dressed in a white shirt with a black tie, a pair of black suit pants, as well as some fancy-looking dress shoes. His hair was pitch black, and his eyes were a vibrant red unlike any she had seen before. His skin was a tad bit on the pale side, but it wasn't anything sickly. 
There was also the fact that he was handsome, almost a bit too stunning, so much so that she had believed that it was because of a quirk. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, where are we? Mikan asked, looking around to see that she had been laying on a flat of grass, next to her bench, and from where the boy was standing, she could see a sidewalk and a couple of trees. Mizutafu City Park I took you here because it was the closest place to where that alleyway had been, the teen answered, walking over to the bench and taking a seat. It was only in the light that she noticed the supernatural glow of his skin. It honestly reminded Mikan of those fantasy vampires she read about in those pre-quirk era books. A part of her wanted to ask what the boy's quirk had been, but another part of her told her that was rude, so she decided against it. However, she still had a question she needed to ask him. One that was on her mind even more than anything else. Where's that villain? Is he nearby? Are you some sort of vigilante? If so, I'll have to. Relax, the teen assured, putting his hands into his pockets. I called the police after I got you out of that situation. I had no choice but to use my quirk while getting you out of there, but it was for your own good. All you have to know is that the villain will be most likely put away under the charge of selling trigger and attempted sexual assault of a minor, the teen explained as he brushed a hand through his hair. Oh, sorry for assuming, it's just, well, you know, vigilantism has been on the rise lately, and my father and his unit of the police force has been cracking down on it pretty hard. I want to be a police officer too, so. Mikan said as the teen smirked, looking over at her with a gleam in his eyes. Yotsukachi Mikan, correct? As the teen asked that, Mikan couldn't help but shudder. She didn't know why, but the eerie calmness of his voice made her feel uneasy. It was almost like she had been in a conversation with some sort of supervillain. But of course, that couldn't be right. He had just saved her for crying out loud. Uh, yeah, I am. What about it? Mikan asked, her eyes glancing at him with an uneasy gleam. The black-haired teen smiled, standing up from the bench as he outstretched a clawed hand to her. Well, it just so happens that I know where you live. Before you ask, no, I'm not a stalker. I live right across the street from your family's house in the apartment building. I can take you home if you'd like, the teen offered as Mikan looked at the hand. The fingers had sharp claws on the ends, and they looked a little bit red. She had a knack for observing things, so it was easy for her to tell if someone had just gotten into a fight. The way his fingers had been bent, it was almost like he had just gotten out of a fight, and with the red under his fingernails, of which she assumed that it was blood, unless it was leftover nail paint, there had been a chance that he had to fight to save her. She wasn't going to say anything. She was lucky to be alive as it were. If the team before her hadn't rushed in when he did... Yeah, sure, Mikan said, taking his hand as he helped her up. When she got to her feet, she realized that the two were of similar height. Well, he had two, maybe three inches on her, but that was it. That was when a thought came to her mind. This whole time they had been talking, and yet, she hadn't gotten to know his name. So, she asked. Uh, I never got your name, what is it? He blinked, seemingly caught off guard by the question. Oh, my name? The teen asked, rubbing the back of his neck. Well, my name is... Musin. You can call me Musin. Musin Kibutsuji, the teen, Musin, answered as he smiled at her. Come on, let's get you home. Your parents are probably worried sick about you. And with that, the two teenagers did just that. The walk was rather long, lasting about an hour. Mizutafu City Park was a far way away from the villas, and while that in its own right would have made the walk awkward, there was something different about walking next to Musin that didn't make it that way. The whole time she walked alongside Musin, she felt safe. Mikan didn't know why she did, but she did. There was this aura around him. An aura of strength. Not only that, but he was always on his guard, always ready to get into a fight if he saw the need to. She could tell based on how his shoulders were tensed up and how his arms were arched when he put his hands in his pockets. 
It was like they were spring-loaded, ready to strike someone in the face in case they tried anything funny. Whoever this musing person was, they were strong. Although, if there was one thing that confused Mekon, it was what he was wearing. It looked like a school uniform, but not one she recognized. Not to mention the fact that he looked a lot like the missing Izuku Midoriya, down to the cat-like irises. The only difference separating the two was the fact that Musen had pure black hair. Perhaps they were distant cousins? Or perhaps half-brothers? Same father, different mother? Whatever the case was, it was uncanny. But then again, Izuku Midoriya had been missing for over four years, and his missing person's case had been put on ice even before a year had passed. Most of the police force across the country had assumed him dead, especially after what had happened to his mother. Once they got to her house, Musin stayed by the gates as she approached the door. She waved him off as he walked across the street to the apartment building. It was strange having an apartment building in the villas, but it had been there for years, and the person who managed the place lived in the villas themselves, so it was pretty much there for convenience. Plus, the apartment building itself had been there before the villa project had begun, and the owner refused to tear it down. If she remembered correctly, only 20 other people lived in the building out of the 150 rooms. It wasn't a profit-making machine like it used to be, but the owner didn't seemingly care all too much about that aspect. For a moment, Mikan thought it strange that a teen his age could afford his own apartment, though he had said the rent was supposedly cheap, so around 12,500 yen a month, which was what most fast food workers got paid every two weeks, so she could buy the fact that Musin was able to afford it at their shared age. When she opened the front door to the foyer slash living room, she was greeted by her mother sitting at the table, a sly smirk on her face. Mom, I swear to. So, who was that handsome young man walking you to the door? Takamai Tsukachi, Mikan's mother, asked as the brown-haired teenager rolled her eyes, closing the door behind her. Does every boy that walks me home have to be a sudden romantic interest, Mom? Mikan replied as her mother feigned offense, gasping as she put her hand to her chest in such a dramatic way that it would make most theater kids blush with envy. Oh, you assume the worst of me. How awful. How could you do that to your mother? Mrs. Tsukachi said as Mikan repressed a laugh. Seeing as her joke was successful, the older woman smiled. Seriously, Mikan. Who was that? I've never seen him in our neighborhood before. I'm just making sure I know everyone who interacts with you, just in case something bad happens. You know how paranoid your dad can get, what with you being daddy's little girl and all that jazz. Mikan snorted, taking her shoes off at the door. Well, for the record, his name was Musen Kibutsuji. He lives in the apartment complex across the street from the entrance of the villa. He saved me from an attempted villain attack. He apparently called the police, a different unit that dad's in, so I don't know if he can confirm or deny that. Had it not been for him. I might be dead right now, Mikan said, shuddering as she said that last bit. Takamai paled at that. You know not to joke around like that, Mikan. You're scaring me, the older woman said as Mikan shook her head. I'm not joking, Mom. I'm serious. If Kibutsuji hadn't been there, I would be dead. I witnessed a drug trade with my ex-friend, Suki. I say ex-friend because I don't hang out with drug addicts. I don't want to get corrupted. As Mikan said that, Takamai got up from her chair and rushed over to Mikan, enveloping her in an unsuspected hug. Jiga. Mom. I'm just glad you're okay. Oh my god, I don't know what I would have done if you wound up hurt, or worse. Takamai said, her voice full of worry as pinpricks of tears appeared in her eyes. You know what, I want to thank this musing person myself in person, Takamai continued as she let go of her daughter and took a step back. I want you to invite him over for dinner tomorrow after school. Okay? Mikan nodded. She didn't have anything else to say to her mom. She didn't want to make her any more paranoid than she already was. God forbid dad hears about this. Hey, mom. Mikan began as Takamai, who was about to walk away, stopped midstride as she glanced over at the brunette. 
Do you think you can keep this between me and you? I... I don't want to worry Dad any more than he already is. What with the hero cannibal still being on the loose? Takamai chewed on the inside of her lip before nodding. Yeah. That's a good idea, the older woman replied, walking over to sit down at the desk. On another note entirely, do you have any schoolwork you need to do, or? And that was when Nikon realized she forgot something back before she ran away from the villain in the alleyway. I might have forgotten my backpack while I was running away from the villain. Well, we have plenty of binders and backpacks in the basement. Tomorrow, ask your teachers for any of the work you haven't completed up to that point. Tell them all of it got destroyed in a villain attack. If there is an issue, I'll deal with it, okay? Takamai said as Mikan nodded, heading toward her room. Today had been a long day, and all she wanted to do was sleep. Detective Naomasa Tsukachi stood at the end of an alleyway, arms folded as he watched someone analyze the corpse of yet another pro hero, have eaten and missing identifying features. Although, based on how they looked, it appeared to be the hero who went by the name Dunabagi. Dunabagi had been in a lot of scandals, such as allowing human traffickers to walk away so long as he got a 45% cut of the pay that the person they were trafficking was worth. He also had been known for spreading several money laundering schemes, which affected thousands of people in the process. Despite that, though, Dunabagi was a good hero. He had saved thousands of lives, jailed hundreds of villains, and was ranked 20th on the billboard. That, however, was overshadowed by his crimes. Tsukachi didn't even feel bad for most of the heroes who were killed by the hero cannibal. However, he was a police officer, and as such, it was his job to make sure that this villain was put behind bars. For years, 24 heroes are killed per year. That's 88 heroes. They kill two heroes per month. This is the end of February, so if their pattern stays the same, another hero will die on the 12th of March. And with staying killing heroes, too. I swear these two are working together in some way. As Tsukachi thought that, he snapped to attention as the person who was analyzing the corpse side, standing up with a shake of their head. The person in question had bright lime green hair. He was wearing a white and black striped shirt with black pants, held up by a leather belt with a golden belt buckle. His skin was extremely pale, yet despite that, he looked far healthier than most others. When he turned to face the detective, his purple eyes with cat-like irises stared into the detective's normal, brown eyes. It's him, all right. But I'm serious, detective. You can't take him down on your own. Especially if he's devoured 88 people. While it sounds like a lot, I can assure you that if he is what I think he is, that is nothing compared to what he could be doing, the man said as Tsukachi narrowed his eyes. What's that supposed to mean, Yamamoto-san? Yamamoto scoffed, dismissing him with a flick of a wrist. Oh, you know, it could be in the thousands by now. He's been active for four years, and he doesn't target innocent civilians. I've been alive long enough to know that things like him are more dangerous than your average villain, the man said as Tsukachi sighed. Seriously? You're still going on about this whole demon crap? Look, Yamamoto... I'm glad we could get your help on this. I never realized that you used to be a mortician, but the fact of the matter is this. The person we're after most likely is just your typical cannibal who eats the people he kills. That's all he is, nothing more, nothing less. As Tsukachi said that, Yamamoto seemed to get angry, but he quickly controlled himself with a deep breath. I don't know why I bother nowadays. The man muttered, walking past Tsukachi. I'm telling you, detective, you're dealing with a creature of the night. You're dealing with a demon. An honest-to-God, man-eating demon. I just hope he doesn't find out where you live. Because I don't doubt for a second he won't be getting for the family that's giving him issues. For your sake, I suggest you look into the Taisho Air Massacre of Tokyo City. Maybe then you might believe me. And with that, Yamamoto walked away. Tsukachi shook his head, directing the other police to close off the area. He honestly didn't know why he allowed him to investigate the corpses of the heroes. 
He was already confirming what they knew, but he insisted. The last time they told him no, he found out the hard way that Yamamoto was stronger than he looked. Needless to say, they let him investigate ever since. And ever since then, he had been trying to get Tsukachi to believe in all this demon crap. Living in a world of quirks told Tsukachi that quirks were capable of things that most people would find unnatural. He could live with the fact that sludge people were a thing. He could also live with the fact that people like All Might could exist, hell, he was close friends with the man in question. But demons? That was playing with his ability to suspend his disbelief. Taisho Era Massacre of Tokyo City, huh? Whatever, I'll look into it when I have free time, Tsukachi thought as he walked over to his car. It was 8.35 p.m., and he wanted to go home. Ever since his argument with his wife, he had reduced his hours from 15 hours a day to 10 hours but got increased pay due to his status in the police force. Don't get him wrong. He loved his job to death, but his family came first and foremost. His family needed him there more than anyone else. It was selfish, but it was his priority. He had almost fallen into the same trappings his father had allowed himself to get caught up in, and because of that, he almost lost his family. But now, he knew better. He just wished that it was something other than the threat of losing his family that made him realize he was overworking himself. As he pulled away from the crime scene and headed home, he felt a chill run up his spine. Winter was still just subsiding, and it was pretty cold out. Even though it was the end of February, it was still negative five degrees out. He had left his rear window open for the whole time he had been investigating, and now he had to pay for it. Neo Mesa hated the cold. It was something he always has, and will continue to hate. It wasn't because he had ever had a bad experience with the cold, it was just that it made him uncomfortable. It made him feel like he was buried up to his waist in snow, with below zero winds blowing on him with no hints of stopping. Rolling up his window and cranking up the heating system in his car, he sighed. Mike Radio was playing on the stereo system at a low volume. He had it on just for background noise. It usually helped him concentrate on things. These last four years had put him under far too much stress. First, it was the hero killer and his recent 54th kill. It was a poor lady by the name of Ikuten Akamatsu, a.k.a. the Sunlight Hero Solar. Her crime? Doing one too many ad reads and not being able to save two or three people from a burning building out of 120. At least when it came to the hero cannibal, the ones he killed were scums of the earth or were former criminals turned heroes to cover their asses. Yes, what the hero cannibal was doing was awful, disgusting, and downright inhumane. But at least they killed actual fake heroes. Sure, Stain got one or two heroes that were true scum every now and again, but otherwise, the heroes he killed had made simple, human mistakes. It was truly sad. How he found himself on the side of the hero cannibal when it came to who they killed. It was more than just sad. It was disturbing how he somewhat agreed with the hero cannibal's actions. Just like the hero killer, the hero cannibal had gathered quite the online following. He was held in the same regard as the hero killer, too, seen as someone who would purge the fakes and leave nothing of them behind, quite literally. There had been times when hero cannibal fans ran into hero killer fans and a fight ensued. It was kind of funny to watch. They both did the same thing. The only difference was that the hero cannibal was going after real fake heroes and was, well, a cannibal. Of course, he was also a villain, and he found it difficult to truly agree with everything the hero cannibal had done. He simply saw the good that it did. How these awful people were being dealt with that the law couldn't catch. And while he would have preferred for them to be brought to justice and put behind bars, the idea of them not being able to hurt anyone anymore was appealing, if not disturbing. In fact, the only reason he was so hellbent on arresting the hero cannibal, outside of him being documented as an S-class villain with absolutely no identifiable features, image, or even appearance, was that Neo Mesa was worried that he would eventually turn to the public. As his car pulled into the driveway, Neo Mesa turned off the engine, exited his car, then walked toward the front door. 
Taking his house keys from his trench coat pocket, he unlocked the door and stepped inside. I'm home. Neo Mesa announced as his wife shushed him. Taking off his trench coat and putting it on the coat hanger, he was in the process of taking off his hat as his eyes met his wife's. Mikan's asleep. She's had a long day, and she needs a rest, Takamai said as she put down her phone, then stood up and walked toward Neo Mesa. The two shared a quick kiss as she grabbed him by the chin. You need to shave again. Your face is getting rough again. You know how much I hate it when you get facial hair. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'll shave in the morning. More importantly, did Mikan get her schoolwork done? Neo Mesa asked, walking toward the kitchen to get himself a late night cup of coffee. She forgot her bag at school. I already scolded her about it, so you don't need to, Takamai said as Neo Mesa raised an eyebrow. Wow, that's the first time you've lied to me in a very, very long time, Neo Mesa said, looking over his shoulder. Let me guess, she actually left it at Suki's? Neo Mesa asked as Takamai shrugged. Well, Mikan didn't want you to worry, so she asked me to lie to you. To be fair to her, she still doesn't know how your court works in full detail. All she knows is that you can pick up on lies easier than truths. Considering you're literally a walking lie detector, I would have hoped she understood that lying to you is impossible, Takamai lamented as Neo Mesa shrugged. The detective finished pouring his cup of black coffee and took a sip, a jolt of energy rushing through him as he smirked. Well, that's not true. Half-truths don't register as lies. If she really didn't want me to know, she'd work on getting good and saying half-truths. Takamai giggled at that, walking up behind him and wrapping her arms around his shoulders, putting her head next to his as she kissed his cheek. He smirked, looking into her eyes. You want something, don't you? He teased, and that was all she wrote. He was just barely able to put his coffee down on the counter before being dragged up the stairs. The sound of a door slamming shut from the upstairs of the Tsukachi household reverberated throughout the house as Mikan, in her room, tossed over to one side, covering her ears with her pillow. It was going to be a long night. Izuku Midoriya, or as the world now knew him, Musen Kibutsuji, was sitting on a couch in his 12,500 yen a month apartment with a cup of blood in his hands, watching TV with an almost amused expression on his face. The apartment he lived in was quite small, only having a living room and kitchen both connected and separated by a thin wall. The living room had a couch, a coffee table, a window to look out of, a TV and a TV stand, and a bookshelf where he kept all of his books. The kitchen had a fridge, a deep freezer, an oven, and a few cupboards with a microwave just above the stove. Then there was the bedroom right next to the entrance of the apartment, which he had converted into an office, seeing as he didn't need to sleep all that often, only sleeping when he was feeling lazy, which was usually never. Of course, on the opposite end of the hallway entrance to his apartment, which had a small bathroom with a stand-up shower, a toilet, and a sink. Nothing too special, and nothing that he gave much of a crap about. Demons didn't need to use the bathroom, so it really served no purpose. Right now, Izuku was in the middle of watching reruns of One Piece, which was something that he enjoyed doing when he had nothing to do, or when he had gotten done filling his quota for the month. It kept him from being bored, which was one of the many plus sides of One Piece. It never got boring, which was something he couldn't say for most other shows nowadays. He found the action and the world building in the old prequark era show to be far better than what shows were out nowadays. According to old news articles in 2031, when One Piece released its last chapter, Chapter 2081, the world stood still. Or at least, Shonen Jump, the company, went on a month hiatus to celebrate the manga finishing. If the demon had to make his opinion known, the fight with Kaido would still be his favorite out of all of the fights before or after. That included the fight with Luffy vs. Shanks near the end of the series, which was a close second. Going back to the topic at hand, when Izuku had thought up his alternate name of Musen Kibutsuji, it had come to him almost instantly. It wasn't like he had to put any thought into it, it was just the first thing his mind came up with. Also, in order to hide the fact that he was still Izuku, he dyed his hair pitch black. 
Most of the missing person posters described him as having green and black hair, so dyeing his hair black was a pretty smart, if not obvious, choice. As for how he got the cup of blood, well, he used to have a next-door neighbor who he caught trying to rape his seven-year-old niece. Not his niece, but the neighbors. He had no extended family, at least to his knowledge. He was able to get the kid to leave the room before he butchered her sick uncle, so that way he didn't have to make himself kill a child. And now, Izuku had a body in his freezer, which he slowly picked away at throughout the weeks whenever he was hungry and hadn't found a fake hero to murder and eat. Throughout the years of devouring people, he had grown at least 100 times as strong as he used to be. If he put actual effort into his attacks now, he could assumedly level forests within seconds. Of course, he never tried to do anything like that. But if push came to shove, he knew he could. His regeneration capabilities had skyrocketed, as when one hero who had a flame quirk tried to turn him into ash using some sort of pyrokinesis quirk, he was able to regenerate while his cells were being actively burned. In other words, he could regenerate before he started burning. Of course, that was just basic fire quirks. He knew he had absolutely no chance of taking out Endeavor, which was his personal goal at the moment. To kill and devour Endeavor for rumors of being a child abuser. As for the hero with the pyrokinesis quirk, he was just as typical as most fakes went. At least, the ones he killed. Attempted rape of a teenage intern, smuggling trigger, so on and so forth. Honestly, it was getting kind of boring hearing about the same despicable bullshit time and time again. Of course, he wasn't going to keep up the whole hero cannibal thing forever. He needed to branch out sooner or later. He just didn't know how. He had a few ideas, but he squashed them before he could actually put them into action. He had already built up the reputation of being someone who killed and ate fake heroes. He had a fan base of supposedly like-minded people, yet they never did anything. In other words, he had attracted manipulatable fools who would do anything their master told them to do. He wasn't going to lie to himself and say that it sounded like a bad idea. To use those people to begin to spread his name, to advance being only known as the hero cannibal. However, it was all about execution. If he didn't do it just right, and someone ratted out what he looked like, he was going to be in trouble. Serious, serious trouble. The last thing he wanted was for All Might to be at his doorstep and for a fight to ensue. He was strong, Izuka knew that much, but he wasn't All Might levels of strong. Not even close. He decided he needed to go for a walk. And so, downing the rest of the blood in his cup, he got up from his couch, shut off the T.V right as Luffy was about to go into gear 5, and went to put on his suit jacket and fedora. As he was getting ready, he sighed. He had just gotten back from saving the life of one Nikon Tsukachi, which in all honesty, he did because the younger side of his mind, the side that still wanted to be a hero, had told him to do so. Now granted, he wasn't going to let some creep sexual assault a teenager, hell he had dealt with several pedophiles and sickos over the past four years, but the more cynical side of his brain had told him that he should have let her die. The reason? Because she was a Tsukachi. And if any family, or anyone for that matter, was going to be the thing that would become a thorn in his side, it would be them. Originally, he had planned to kill them all, but now that Nikon knew of him, well, it didn't change much, but there had been people seen with him walking her home. So if suddenly two days from now their family had turned up dead and eaten, and those people who saw him were smart, they'd report the fact that he had been seen with her two days prior, and end up putting two and two together. So, that plan was thrown out the window faster than he could blink. Now, he had to do something else. He had to think of another plan. Which was part of the reason why he was now going out for this little walk around the villas. He had explored the place many, many times before. In fact, he knew this place like the back of his hand. That still didn't mean he didn't like going on walks around the place. It put him at ease and allowed him to think clearly. That, and not many people would be out and about during the night. He'd see the occasional dog walker, and that was it. 
He also knew a lot of people in the area thanks to him doing babysitting for some of the parents, on top of also walking dogs when he was asked, mowing lawns, shoveling snow in the winter, all that stuff. This was on top of his job at McDonald's as a cashier and cook, which in total brought his monthly income up to a whopping 33,210 yen a month. It wasn't much, but he had built up quite the bank account, his total being at around 1.5 million yen. He had been doing these odd jobs for years, and at that time he was living in that old abandoned building with the other squatters. It was only just this year that he was able to rent out the apartment he lived in now. And seeing as he didn't need to buy food, his expenses were considerably cheaper than what most other people had to pay. It was one of the props of not being a human. Taking a shortcut down toward the nearby park separate from Yuzutafu City Park, he found himself walking down a path near the playground. As he walked, he saw a man in a black hoodie up ahead. He couldn't make out the person's features, but he did know that it wasn't someone he had been familiar with. The man was tall, wearing a black hoodie and a pair of gray sweatpants. He had his hands in his pockets, and his head was lowered. It was almost like he didn't want his face to be seen. Izuku kept that in mind as they crossed paths. And as soon as they did, the man had turned around and got behind Izuku, putting a knife to his throat as Izuku lifted his head just enough to make way for the attempted criminal's hand. Don't make any sudden movements. If you do, I'll slit your throat. The man spat, his voice almost crazed sounding. Just like he had thought, a drug addict. What do you want, sir? I'm sure we can come to a peaceful agreement here, Izuku said, trying to de-escalate the situation. In reality, he had hoped the man had tried something. Not that Izuku wanted to beat the snot out of this guy, but he wasn't going to lie and say that he wasn't pissed off that someone had dared try to mug him. Shut the fuck up. Now, you listen to me. You're going to hand over any valuables you have, and then you're going to say nothing to no one. You hear me. The man practically screamed as Izuku rolled his eyes. Of course, the man couldn't see him do that, but it was a simple gesture that showed just how much Izuku did not care about this punk. But, just for curiosity's sake. And if I don't? Then I'll fucking kill you. The man shouted, kneeing Izuku in the back as he pretended to stagger forward, the blade of the knife grazing against his skin as it regenerated instantly. Now hand everything over, you piece of shit. Well, he did escalate it. That gave him a reason to do this. Izuku whipped around and clocked the man in the face so hard that when he fell to the ground, the ground shook and the man's nose had been pushed inward to his face. When the hood came off, Izuku immediately recognized the person. Because the man wasn't a man and was actually someone from his old elementary school, granted now a teenager, but he couldn't ever mistake that pointed chin. Well, well, well. If it isn't Mr. Longfingers, Izuku said, a smirk on his face as he picked the junkie up by his collar. He recognized that pointed chin and long hair from anywhere, though he never bothered to put his name to memory. His eyes were bloodshot, and what remained of his nose was bleeding profusely. And the look he was getting from him was priceless. The shock, surprise, and more importantly fear within the junkie's bloodshot eyes was more than enough for Izuku. Sea Cat Eyes B but I thought you double you went. The junkie didn't get the chance to finish his sentence as one of Izuku's whips came out of his back, making whatever it was he had to say die in his throat. However, compared to how his whips usually were, there was something different about them that Izuku had been curious about for a good long while. Ever since he had started eating other people, blood would occasionally drip from the whips, almost like a hypodermic needle. Now, granted, he had tried using his whips while they were dripping with blood on the fake pro heroes before, but they seemed to melt every time he had stabbed them. So, he assumed that was all the dripping blood did, melt them from the inside out. Of course, he'd eat the remains afterward, that way no one would have to clean that mess up, but the point still stood. However, recently, a nagging part of his mind had been telling him to continue piercing people and injecting them with his blood. But each and every time, the fake heroes he injected would just melt. He didn't know why his mind was so focused on injecting people with blood, but he just assumed that it was his body telling him to experiment with his new power. 
Sure, melting humans was fun to watch, but it got boring after a while. That didn't mean, however, he was just going to let this guy walk away now. Especially since he recognized him. I hope you don't mind, but you're going to become something of an experiment. I'm testing out a new ability my quirk awakened a few months back. I hope you don't mind, Izuku said as the bone whip lurched back and stung the junkie as a scorpion would when it was threatened. Izuku dropped the teen to the floor as his veins began to bulge, pulsate, and squirm within his body. The junkie screamed in pain as he writhed on the floor. Izuku watched with confusion, seeing as this never happened before. The reaction had always been for the body to begin to decay at an accelerated rate, then melt into a puddle of nothingness. But this? This was different. The junkie's skin began to shift in color, turning a pukish green as his eyes began to drain of color, and for the pupil to turn into a similar style to Izuku's own. The junkie's nose began to pop back out and into its normal place, the junkie's teeth sharpening and turning to something more akin to what a wolf's mouth would be full of. The junkie's hands turned into claws, and just like that, the junkie no longer screamed, no longer writhed, and no longer jerked. The junkie slowly stood up, a growling sound coming from him as his eyes now bright green eyes with orange scara stared at Izuku with an almost anticipating gleam. Izuku was confused. He had no idea what it was he was staring at, outside of the fact that he made it with his blood. The junkie from just two seconds ago, who had been writhing and screaming on the floor in utter agony, was now staring at him after transforming. It made no hostile movements toward him, staying completely still, almost as if it was waiting for something. Like a command. Almost as if it was loyal to him. Face me. As Izuku said that, the junkie turned to face him. From there, he could see just what it was that had happened. His eyes hadn't been deceiving him, his skin had changed from a tannish brown to a sickly greenish yellow. His eyes were green, while the scara had been a vibrant orange. Its pupils were slit, similar to that of Izuku's own eyes. He couldn't see in the junkie's mouth, but he had to assume that his teeth had changed, too. The junkie's hands had also transformed, now looking more like Izuku's claws. It was almost as if Izuku's blood transformed the junkie into another version of himself. Into a demon. The black-haired teen hummed in contemplation, crossing his arms as he stood there. That was when he thought of something. What is your name? Izuku asked the demon, who then lowered himself to one knee in a bowing position. My name is Ido, my lord, the demon said, its voice gravely. Izuku raised an eyebrow. Lord? He was this junk Vito's lord? Was it because of his blood? But that makes no sense. Every time I injected a fake hero with my blood, they melted from the inside out. What makes Ido so special? Izuku thought as a contemplating expression made its way to his face. This demon, he's already loyal to me for no other reason than the fact that I injected him with my blood. He could help me hunt down fake heroes, or... This could be the start of my rise to becoming Japan's Demon King. I've been building up a name for myself for four years. Granted, I've only been known as the Hero Cannibal, but... This could be a massive change. Ido, Izuku started, the demon looking up at him with anticipation. From here on out, you will be loyal to me, and to me alone. Your first course of action is to head back to the place you called home and devour your family. They will serve no purpose to you or me from here on out. Once you finish that, make sure nothing is left behind, and continue your life as normal. If you ever get hungry and wish to feast on human flesh, only do so in the dead of night, and only on criminals or who you deem as fake heroes. For the time being, civilians are to be left alone. Any deviation from those rules that I have set in place, and you will perish. And if anyone asks you who you work for, if ever at all, tell them this name, Musen Kibutsuji. Do I make myself clear to you? Ito nodded, bowing his head. Yes, my lord. Very good, Izuku hummed. Now leave. Do as your lord commands. Without a second of hesitation, Ito stood up and walked past Izuku in the opposite direction of where he had originally been going. 
The bone whip that had been used to inject the blood into Ito slithered back into Izuku's spine as the black-haired teen smirked. He now had a plan as to how to get rid of the Tsukachi family. Of course, for the time being, he'd wait to see if he could up the chances of turning people into demons rather than melting them. He would have to do various experiments as well. Because with this new power he had at his disposal, it would mean that he could do a whole lot more than what he had originally thought. That, and it also brought a new possibility to the table that hadn't expected. Two bright yellow eyes and a toothy grin. A laugh as infectious as the most viral flu. A smile that radiated joy. Is it possible? Izuku thought, not even noticing that he had stabbed his hand with his claws. He got the image out of his mind. He would need to experiment first before he tried something so reckless. A frown came to his face as he looked down at himself. Would she even want to be my friend again after all this time? After all that I've done? For years ago, Natsumi Nakaim died due to being jumped and brutally assaulted by three thugs in an alleyway. Izuku then returned the favor tenfold and rushed Natsumi back to the hospital. She died before the doctors could have even attempted to save her life. Two heroes who went by the name of Altitude and Gale had stood around and let the whole thing happen. They had been two feet away from the alleyway. In fact, they had been leaning up against the wall right next to the mouth of the alleyway and heard it all go down. And yet, they did nothing to stop the horrible beating. And they were the first two heroes that Izuku had killed in what would at the time become Izuku's new job, purging the country of fake heroes. Real, fake heroes, and not the crap that Stain did. It was also what would then later awaken his demonic urges, and what resulted in him devouring his mother, which then showed him what his purpose in life was, that being to become Japan's new demon king. And now, he could create demons out of his own blood. Granted, it was only once, and he had only tried it on a living person. But, if he could resurrect the dead as demons, that could mean he had the chance to bring Natsumi back. After four years of having no one to talk to, he could finally bring his best friend back from the dead. For a moment he considered bringing back his mother if it worked, but he quickly discarded the idea. He didn't want to be faced with the person he had murdered. That would have left a bad taste in his mouth. Again, this was all hypothetical. It wasn't set in stone. He first had to make sure that his blood could resurrect the dead, and how often it was that they turned into demons and not a giant pile of flesh and blood soup on the ground. And he'd do that tomorrow. He had too much excitement for one day. In a quiet, suburban home, three people sat at a dinner table. The first one sat at the front, back facing the window as they held their chopsticks with a smile, lifting a dumpling up to their mouth. Their tannish brown skin covered in black polka dots being one of their most notable features. They were a woman, with long black hair traveling down to the ends of their back, wearing a white shirt and brown pants. The second person was a little girl with light brown hair, who sat opposite the woman, that being her mother. She was no older than five, with a bright smile on her face. She had a small plate of carrots and rice, seeing as that was the only thing she could willingly eat. She was wearing kid-sized summer dress and her favorite MT lady slippers. The third and final person was a man, his hair short and graying. He was the elder of the family, and his son, the woman's ex-husband, who had died of a stroke two years back was not here, so he filled the empty space in the family's life for the wife's request. He was wearing a plaid red and green shirt, as well as a pair of off-white shorts. He raised a pair of chopsticks to his mouth before silently slurping back some noodles. Mama, when is Onyai-chan coming home? The little girl asked as the mother sighed. I don't know, sweetheart. You know he likes going out late with his friends. He could be gone till the sun comes up. As the mother said that, the little girl pouted, poking at her rice with her chopsticks. The older man shook his head, swallowing the food in his mouth. He's a disgrace, the old man grumbled, earning a glare from the woman. Gigi, take that back. Onyai-chan isn't, isn't a... Whatever you just called him. I don't know what it means, but it sounds rude. The little girl said as the old man scoffed. He's a drug addict, Tammy-chan. 
you wouldn't know what that means anyway. Your brother has fallen down a slippery slope, and as far as I am concerned, he is no grandson of mine. Not until he cleans up his act. That is quite enough out of you, Odo-san. You know he's not taking the death of his father very well. You would be the same if it was the other way around. The mother practically shouted as the old man shook his head, staring down at his food. We can argue about this all we want. It does not change my stance. Until that boy cleans up and gets his act together, I want nothing to do with him, the older man said, continuing to eat his food. Just as he was about to put another helping of noodles into his mouth, the sound of the door closing echoed throughout the house. Speak of the devil. Everyone turned to watch as a hooded figure walked up the stairs, still wearing the same thing that he had worn since he left, that being a black hoodie and a pair of gray sweatpants. The little sister jumped out of her chair and ran towards the hooded figure, embracing him with a tight hug around the legs. Onyachan, you're home. Gigi keeps insulting you. I don't like it. Tell him he's wrong. There was nothing but silence from the figure, his head lowered and out of sight from the family. The little girl backed away slightly, the uncomfortable silence drawing on just that much longer. Onyachan, is everything all right? The older brother placed a hand on the little girl's shoulder, his head raising to meet her eyes. The little girl gasped, trying to back away, but to no avail. Both the older man and the mother jumped out of their chairs upon seeing the boy's face. His expression was blank, his eyes were green and orange, and his skin was a pukish green. Something was wrong with Ito, and nobody knew what it was that was causing it. Although he didn't seem to be ill, his appearance made that out to be an entirely different case. Ito, what happened to you? The mother's question went ignored as Ito placed another hand on the little girl's opposite shoulder. His grip was ironclad, and no matter how hard the little girl tried to move away or to get him to let go, Ito's hold on her never wavered. Onyachan, you're hurting me. I'll let go. The little girl cried out, only for a gleam to appear in the sickly teen's eyes. It was a dangerous, predatory glare. One that someone would see in a wolf when staring down a sheep or a deer or anything else for that matter. Oi! Brat, your mother's talking to you. Answer her. What the hell happened to? There was no hesitation. There was no moment of consideration. Nothing was stopping Ito from doing what he did next. His maw opened, revealing his sharp, canine-like teeth. The little girl screamed, but it was all for naught as Ito bit down on the little girl's forehead, tearing out a chunk of flesh from the girl's head and pinning her to the floor as she screamed in pain. There was a scream of horror from the mother, and with that scream the woman rushed toward her daughter, slamming a foot into Ito's face, knocking him off of the little girl as he growled. When the mother looked down at the girl, she choked back a horrified gasp mixed with a sob. Her face had been eaten off, her eyes ripped out, and nothing more than a skull remained from where her face had been. She was dead, nothing more, and nothing less. The mother could do nothing but look down in horror, riddled with shock and anger, so much so that she didn't see Ito stand up and rush her, grabbing her by the throat, a gagging sound coming from the woman as she stared at Ito, no, the monster that Ito had become. She started kicking his body as he lifted her high up toward the ceiling, but as she kicked, she felt her body become weaker, her movements became slower, and her ability to breathe become nothing but a fair-out dream. And then, with a flick of Ito's wrist, he snapped her neck, dropping her to the floor. Ito scanned the area, trying to find where the old man had gone, but to no avail. Unbeknownst to him, the old man was creeping up behind him, fear and rage in his eyes as he brandished a butcher's knife. When the old man got within lunging distance, he did just that, lunging toward Ito with a shout of rage. Ito whipped his head around, eyes widening for a split second as the force and weight of the old man's body sent the monster to the ground. Now on top of Ito, the old man started repeatedly stabbing Ito in the face over and over again. You monster! You bastard! You worthless waste of oxygen! Die! 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 
The old man shouted as tears came to his eyes. You killed my daughter. You killed my granddaughter. You're a disgrace to the family name. You should have never been bore. The old man's incoherent, rage-filled ranting was stopped when he gasped. He looked down to see an arm coated in red energy stabbed through his body, right through his chest as blood spilled out of his mouth. The knife fell out of the old man's hands, the blade coated with blood. He stared at Ito's face, eyes widening as the stab wounds that had littered every inch of his head slowly sealed. I don't know. Ito began as he slowly stood up, the old man coughing with each of Ito's movements. How I did that? It happened on instinct. Ito continued as he smirked. That wasn't my quirk, that much I know. As Ito spoke, he drew out his arm from the old man's chest, the old man crumpling over and falling flat on his face, his eyes glazed over, blood running down his mouth as Ito stared down at his limp, lifeless body. Whatever. I don't care about that, right now. I'm hungry. Ito howled, maw opening once more as he started digging into the old man's corpse, devouring every last inch of the man's head. Hello, welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? Izuku Midoriya asked as he stood behind a counter, cash register to his right and drink dispenser to his left. He was wearing a red uniform with the company logo on his right breast pocket. For legwear, he was wearing a pair of black jeans held up by a basic black belt. To top it all off, he was wearing a black hat with, yet again, the company logo on the front of the hat. In front of him was a girl his age, her light brown hair styled in a bob cut and an indefinite pink hue on her cheeks. She had a light tan to her skin, but that was about it. She was wearing a light red jacket and a dark gray skirt with black stockings. He couldn't see the rest due to the counter blocking his view. Ah, sorry, I was spacing out. Uh, I'd like a Tsumiki burger, a medium McFry, and a, hmm, a medium Coca-Cola, please. The girl asked as Izuku smiled your typical employee standard smile and brought up her order. Your total comes to 820 yen. Now, would you like it for here or to go? Izuku asked, keeping up his smile as the girl hummed. I'll take it to go. The girl decided as Izuku nodded, stepping away from the cash register for a split second, then repeated the order back to the chefs, then returned to the counter. Izuku looked behind the girl, noticing no one was there, then sighed. He honestly hated doing customer service. It was beneath him, and he knew it. But it was the only way that he could legally make money. He was already knee-deep in the villain business due to his status as the hero cannibal, and he wasn't even getting paid for it. However, he was working on expanding his claim to fame, and now that he knew that he could turn people into demons with his blood, he had spent all of last night mulling over some ideas for what he could do using this new power. Key of which being if he could use his blood to resurrect the dead. He'd be lying if he had said that the idea of him bringing back Natsumi didn't excite him. However, he also had other priorities. If he was going to become the demon king of Japan, he was going to need a branching network. He needed sources, people who he could trust. So basically, subordinates. However, that was difficult, seeing as he was living in an apartment. And with the Tsukachis being just around the corner, well, that made his life ten times more difficult. He was moving with a collar around his neck. Any wrong move and the police would know he's the hero cannibal. He needed some sort of way to move without being limited. Better yet, he needed some sort of way to move without having to deal with becoming a bigger target. He was already living as Musen Kibutsuji, what with Izuku Midoriya being labeled missing and wanted for potentially being the reason behind Inko Midoriya's death, but that was neither here nor there. And sure, while he could have Ito, the first demon he ever created, do something about the Tsukachis, he had other things in mind for them. So for now, he wasn't going to pester the newly created demon. Besides, it wouldn't help him any, at least not yet. Truly, he was stuck between a rock and a hard place. Hey, uh, hello? The voice of the girl snapped him out of his thoughts as she looked at him with a confused expression. I'm sorry, you just looked, spaced out. 
I was trying to ask you if I've ever seen you before, the girl said as Izuku raised an eyebrow. I don't recall ever seeing you before, ma'am, if that's what you're asking. As Izuku replied, the girl nodded. No, it's just, you look about my age, yet I've never seen you at the middle school before, the girl said as Izuku's eyebrow raised. Right, he forgot. Now that he was living under the name Yuzen Kibutsuji, he could actually go back to school. So long as he kept up the appearance, he'd be able to do just that. Sure, it was just a hair color change, as well as a name change, but it was seemingly enough to get the police off of his back. Oh, I just moved to this area not too long ago. I'd say, about a week ago? Izuku lied. He had been living in the area for far longer. Well, if you called living sitting and festering in an alleyway after the building he had been squatting and got torn down, he had moved into the apartment about one year ago and had been working at this specific McDonald's location for the same amount of time. If he was being honest, he simply just didn't have the time nor the want to be at school. But, if you wanted to add more to whatever potential alibi he might need in the future in case someone did suspect him to be the hero cannibal, for whatever reason they might have had. I just haven't found the time to enroll in the school. Izuku said, shrugging his shoulders as a bag was brought to him. He then opened the bag to do a check, nodded to himself, then passed the girl her food. Your order, ma'am. The girl took it with a smile. Thank you, uh. Oh, how do I pronounce that name? Ki. Boot, Soji? The girl squinted, reading his name tag as Izuku smiled half-heartedly. It's Kibutsuji, not G-E-E -E as in O-G's, but J-E-E -E as in Jeans. Don't ask me why my parents had that strange last name. They just did, Izuku said as the girl nodded. Ah, well, thank you, Kibutsuji-san. Have a good day. I hope to see you at school tomorrow. The girl said as she left the McDonald's. Izuku sighed, looking over at the clock. It was almost time for his lunch break, and with that, he let out a rather exasperated sigh. He really didn't like this job. But, on the bright side, he now met someone within the local area around his age that wasn't Nikon Tsukachi. And then, an idea came to his head. A small smile formed on his face. The smile wasn't that of someone who was happy. No. It would be more appropriate to describe it as a predatory smile. One belonging to someone who had negative, vile intentions. Izuku turned around and walked away to the break room. He had to do some thinking. Ochako Yuraka was what most would call a rather basic girl, with the rather lofty goal of becoming a hero, which that in itself was a rather basic thing for a girl her age to want to do. It was because of her rather basic goals that most people overlooked her, and with her court being considered mediocre compared to some of the others in her school, not many people paid that much attention to her. She had a couple of friends, but she only talked to them at school. Why? Well, it was no secret that Ochako was embarrassed at being poor. Most everyone knew it to be the case, and it made her self-conscious. Hell, most of her food came from the McDonald's across the street from the school because her babysitting job didn't pay enough. She was only barely able to afford rent every month, on top of affording just enough food to survive. That was on top of school hammering down on top of her as the school year came to a close. Her parents offered for her to move back into the house with them, but Ochako refused. She didn't want to burden them with having to spend any more money than they really had to. Was it borderline stupid for her to do that? In her opinion, not so much. Ochako wanted her parents to live the lives they wanted. And to do that, she was going to become a hero. She had been training her quirk in secret, trying to build up the weight she could lift without hurling, as well as the duration. Gravity was a rather useful quirk, and she originally had planned to help her parents out with their construction company. However, her mother and her father both told her to just be a kid and to live her life without having to worry. Yet, Ochako knew that wouldn't be possible. Whenever she did try to do that, she just ended up feeling guilty. And so, that was why she moved out and into her apartment. Her landlords were cruel, though. 
They expected her to pay every note and every coin by the time it was due, otherwise, they'd evict her. It honestly got on her nerves. Another thing that got on her nerves, but for other reasons, was what had been reported on the news. Apparently, the hero cannibal, someone who by the sounds of things ate and killed heroes, was no longer just a hero cannibal. A family was found in uptown Mizutafu devoured, limb from limb, leaving barely anything behind. It made her sick to her stomach that a criminal such as that was praised online for their actions. Sick freaks like them made her stomach turn when articles of people being found partially consumed came about, only to find that there was no DNA evidence left behind of who did it. Not even a single drop of saliva, a splotch of mismatched blood. It was almost as if the hero cannibal had no records of existing. Otherwise, he would have been caught by now. But that wasn't the only thing on her mind. No, the other thing that was on her mind was her money. Specifically, what she owed to certain people. Ochako was no stranger for taking out loans from sketchy loan sharks. Her dues were supposed to have been paid yesterday, and she barely had enough money to do that. In fact, she was short by a couple of thousand yen. She let out a sigh, then shook her head. Think about that after school, Ochako. There's no sense in getting caught up with stuff like that when you have a test after lunch, Ochako thought as she passed by an alleyway. Unfortunately for her, she didn't notice the two street thugs get out of a black car and march toward her from behind. In a matter of seconds, she found a hand wrapped around her mouth, and her hands grabbed with her wrists being restrained, on top of a pair of gloves being slapped over her hands, just so she couldn't use her quirk. A piece of thin rope was tied around her wrists as she was dragged back to the car, kicking and screaming the entire way as her eyes widened with tears. Her captors were large, muscular brutes wearing suits and had sunglasses over their eyes, the only thing noticeable about them being their tan skin, which was shared with most people in the country. She could see that they were both angry, and on top of that, no one was bothering to stop them, all minding their own business. She even recognized some of those people to be her classmates, all standing around with wide eyes, some even taking videos of the event. Stop moving, you daft cunt. One of them spat, getting saliva all over her face as she was thrown into the back of the car. The moment she got into the car, she was sandwiched between the two large men. The moment the doors closed, the car sped off as she struggled to get loose, only to get knocked in the back of the head so hard that she lurched forward and onto the floor of the small car. The fuck did I just say? Stop moving. She was met with a boot to the face right after that, which knocked her out cold. But just before she was, she could see the McDonald's employee she was just talking to stand by the entrance of the building, eyes wide as he had gotten into a stance as if he was about to run to get help. And then, darkness. Ochako's eyes slowly began to open as a searing pain in the back of her head made her wince. Her memory was foggy. The last thing she remembered was that she was walking back to school from McDonald's, and then she was attacked by a couple of suited men. No one bothered to come to her aid, which really annoyed her, and also pissed her off. Some of those people were her classmates and those she considered friends, and yet they did nothing but stare. After she was shoved into a car, she remembered being knocked to the floor of the car, seeing a McDonald's employee run inside the store, and then after that, nothing. She's awake, boss, a gruff voice that the brunette had no idea as to who it belonged to spoke out. Someone, most likely this boss person that the voice mentioned, harshly grabbed her chin, yanking her head to stare upward at someone she barely recognized. They had rather pale skin, their left eye covered by an eye patch while their right eye was dark blue. Their hair was pitch black, and they were wearing a dark brown two-piece suit. She flinched, blinking rapidly as she tried to make it so her vision wasn't so blurry. That was when her mind finally caught up to her, and the sinking realization that she had been kidnapped set in almost immediately. As such, she panicked, trying to get out of whatever situation she found herself in as fast as possible, only to notice that her hands were bound and that her quirk wasn't working. That meant she had something covering her hands. Her feet also weren't splitting apart from one another, as well as her legs, meaning that both were bound. Ochako looked up at the person who had been holding her chin, her eyes wide with fear as the man smirked. Ah, good. 
I have your full attention. The man in front of her spoke as he backed away, shoving her face away as the chair that she was in nearly toppled over. Thankfully, that didn't happen, as the chair had been able to bounce back to the standing up position. Now, I'm sure you're well aware as to why it is you're here, right? The man asked as Ochako looked from the man to the other two pieces of muscle on his left and right flank. Both of them were armed with guns, meaning they were prepared in case something fishy happened, or if someone wanted to play hero. Besides that, she remembered why she was here. Rather than trying to play the smartass or backtalk to the man with two armed thugs to his left and to his right, she answered honestly. You are my debt. Ochako said, her voice shaky, fear riddling her body as the man nodded, his smirk widening. Good. You are smart. I was worried, the man remarked, making the brunette frown, which in turn made him frown. Oh, come now, it was just a joke. Ah well, you win some, you lose some, the man said, putting his arms behind his back. Tell me, Ms. Urarica, do you know just how much you owe? If I remember correctly, you borrowed 150,000 yen to cover your rent for this month on top of any groceries you intended to buy. So, tell me, how much do you think you owe me in return? Ochako gulped. The way he spoke, it was filled with venom. Almost as if he was furious at her for some reason. She was only a day off from her due date when it came to the debt. She needed just a little more time, and then she could come up with what was owed. At least, what she thought she owed. D-double. Ochako stammered as the man huffed. He rose his hand, and when he did, the man to his left aimed his weapon at her right leg, a red laser point aimed at her kneecap. In a panic, she sputtered out, triple. I owe you triple. The man lowered his hand, a satisfied smirk as the armed man lowered his gun. Correct. For a moment there I thought I'd have to shoot out your kneecap, the man said, walking up to her as he drew out a knife. She gulped back her fear for a second time as the knife was put right underneath her chin, the man slowly raising her head with the blade as their eyes met, or in his case, I. Tell me, how much money do you have? 1,500 yen. The man frowned, his eyebrows knitting together. Oh? Only 1,500? The man said, his tone filled with anger. You only have 1,500? Were you trying to swindle me? The man snarled, his teeth gnashed together into a sneer as Ochako's eyes widened. And no. I can pay it back. I just need time. The brunette blurted out, only making the man even more enraged. Those had been the wrong choice of words, as, without even a moment of hesitation, the man lowered his knife from her chin to her throat and sliced it open, pushing the chair back as Ochako felt a surge of pain rush through her. She watched his blood spewed out of her throat like a fountain, and for the man to turn around, mumbling something under his breath. She remembered blinking, watching the man walk away. She blinked again, her vision becoming blurry. Although, she was able to make out flashes of light followed by loud bangs and the sounds of something whistling through the air. And then, the last thing she saw before her vision went dark was a pair of two vaguely familiar red eyes. And then, there was nothing. Izuku had no idea why he was doing this. He ran downtown as fast as he could, jumping from rooftop to rooftop as he played catch up with the car. Granted, he was much faster than the car, but he wanted to keep at a reasonable speed so that he could at least see where it was they were going. It turned out that they were heading for a warehouse, which, in retrospect, made sense. Why would they just perform business out in the open? Of course, it would be tucked away far enough to make sure that they wouldn't get caught. Which kind of made their stunt a few minutes ago seem pointless, but oh well. He had no idea why he was going after that girl, or why he was saving her from whatever fate she was going to have. There was a part of him that told him to leave her to her fate. But another, more vocal part of him told Izuku to save her. Maybe it was the part of him that still wanted to be a hero, or maybe it was just his morals flaring up again. Whatever it was, it didn't matter. As far as Izuku was concerned, he hated seeing innocent lives being destroyed. 
or, well, innocent lives that didn't impact him, anyway. The families of the demons he created notwithstanding, innocent people didn't deserve to be hurt. Not unless they weren't really innocent, which meant that they weren't innocent. That aside, his point still stood. People like that brunette didn't deserve to be kidnapped in broad daylight. It also confirmed to him that the society that he lived in was twisted. More so than he had thought. Instead of trying to help her, everyone just ignored her plight, whipped out their phones, and recorded it as if it was some sort of form of entertainment. And while that sickened him to his very core and made him grow to hate those who he used to call his fellow humans, that, however, was not as important as what he was doing now. When he ripped the employee-only door to the warehouse off of its hinges, and when he entered the room, he watched as a man dressed in a dark brown two-piece suit had just kicked over the seat that she had been sitting on and that a fountain of blood had sprayed upward into the air, meaning that he had slit the poor girl's throat. Anger rushed through his veins as they became more visible on his face, hands, and forehead. When the men saw him, he was met with gunfire. The bullets did nothing to impede him as he tore the heads of the two armed men right off, checking them against the wall behind him, reducing them to nothing but splatters of blood and gray matter on the wall. The man in the middle barely had any time to scream as a hand plunged through his chest and his heart, killing him instantly. Izuku let the body slide off of this hand, his eyes narrowing at the man in question. That body didn't matter, what mattered was the brunette. When he got to her side, he saw that her throat had been slit in such a fashion that it looked like a big smile had been carved there. That meant the two most important vital parts of her throat were slashed. Which meant she was already dead. But, just to make sure, he checked for a pulse. Unfortunately, there was none. He had been too late. Just like with Natsumi, he had been too late. Granted, this defeat didn't sting him nearly as bad as it had when he lost Natsumi, but it still stung. Every time he tried to do the good guy thing, he always failed. He failed to save Natsumi's life, and now he failed to save this brunette. And then, that was when an idea came to Izuku's mind. A tendril came out of his back, and just as he prepared to stab it into the brunette, his head pulsed in pain. Change your form first, you fool, lest she recognizes you. Izuku gripped the side of his head, confusion lacing his expression as he narrowed his eyes. He didn't recognize that voice. Well, no, that would be a lie. He had heard that voice before, but it had been significantly quieter. He first heard it when he was six years old. Back when he was hit by the truck. It was also the same voice that whispered the name to him when he needed one to separate himself from being Izuku Midoriya. After that, it hadn't shown up again. But now it was commanding him to change his form? I do not have much time. My connection with you is limited. As of right now, I am pushing my limits in terms of contact. All you must do to change your appearance is to think of what you want to look like, be it a different person or another version of yourself, preferably the opposite gender. Humans are stupid in that way. Quickly, we do not want to lose your blood's potency, do we? And then, the headache vanished, as did the voice. Think about how he wanted to look. What kind of line of thinking was that? Then again, if the girl thought him to be the same person at the McDonald's, then the voice has a point. It wouldn't be foolish to assume that she couldn't put the dots together and expose me for who I am, Izuku thought as he closed his eyes. His skin began to ripple, his muscles contracting and retracting. He felt his bones shift and change as his organs rearranged themselves. He also felt new ones grow as a result of his transformation. There was a motion within his pants, too, but that wasn't important. His chest also felt a little bit heavier than before as his back adjusted to the new weight. When he was done, he opened his, er, well, her eyes to see that she had successfully changed genders. Her hair was longer, reaching down to just above her chest in the front and reaching down to the middle of her back in the, well, the back. In this form, she had a modest-sized chest, something that Izuku never thought she'd ever think of, ever. You know, seeing as she was naturally born a boy. Aside from the other obvious change, her body was virtually the same. Thin, lean, but not sickly, 
and pale just like she had always been. She also looked taller, to boot. Luckily, the McDonald's uniform she had been wearing didn't rip at all, which saved her from any embarrassment that might have happened due to her transformation. Izuku felt a tinge go up her spine as a result of transitioning, and after a very quick inspection, she confirmed that she had, indeed, become a girl. Gods, this is so weird. Izuku thought as she observed her body. She had to admit, she looked cute as a girl. But now, she would need a new identity if she was going to be this girl. Three names, crap. Oh. When Izuku heard her own voice, she nearly tripped. It sounded just like, like her mother, though a little higher pitched due to her age. She didn't linger on that fact and continued as normal. The last thing she wanted to think about was her mother. While it might have been four years ago, the memory of her mother still stung to reflect upon. So, instead, she decided to focus on the thing that made her nearly trip and fall on her ass, her new voice. I mean, for a 15-year-old, that's still high-pitched. Even the dead girl had a lower-sounding voice than my own. I know. I can use this as my school persona. This form will be Izumi. Izumi Sugiyama. That was a girl who died around 190 years ago back in World War II if my self-taught history is correct. Whatever that doesn't matter. Izuku thought as she ripped the name tag off of her uniform, erased the name off of the name tag, and put Izumi Sugiyama on it before smiling. Putting the name tag back on, Izuku primed her injector tendril to stab the body and counted her lucky stars that it actually worked. The tendril lurched forward and stabbed into the girl's neck, injecting a small portion of blood into her body. Just like with Ido, the girl's body began to shake and veins became more present across her face and presumably the rest of her body. It almost looked like she was having a seizure. If a dead body could have a seizure, that was. After a moment, the brunette's eyes widened in shock, the eyes having changed, just like Ito's. Last she checked, the brunette's eyes weren't pink, obviously. But now, they were. Well, at least, the whites were. Her eye color had stayed the same brown, although the pupils had changed from orbs to slits, much like her own. She retracted the tendril as it slinked into her back. Izuku watched as the wound on the girl's throat closed up and healed. After that, the girl sat up with a gasp, her chest raising up and down as she coughed. H-A? W what? What happened? I... I was... The girl's words died in her throat upon making eye contact with Izuku in her female form. Then, the girl looked to see the three brutally murdered thugs as a scream made its way out from the scared brunette. She tried to scramble away, but with the help of one of Izuku's whips wrapping her legs together, her leaving wasn't possible. Why you? Yo, you're. You're the hero cannibal, aren't you? Damn it. And here I thought I could use this for school. Izuku thought, frowning. Yes. I suppose you're correct. But that hardly matters, Izuku said, crossing her arms as the brunette's eyes narrowed. Why, you monster? You killed that poor family, didn't you? There's only one cannibal in this whole city. So it had to be you. You, you monster. When I become a hero, I'll take you down. The brunette said as Izuku rolled her eyes. That's what they all say, then they end up dead with nothing but their skeletons remaining. Not that you can become a hero, anyway, Izuku quipped as the brunette narrowed her eyes. What does that supposed to mean? The brunette growled as Izuku smirked. Simply put, there are now three cannibals in this city. Myself, my first thrall, and you. When Izuku said that, the brunette's eyes widened, though her expression quickly changed to anger. In a split second, the girl was up on her feet and lunging at Izuku, fist reared back to throw a punch, only for Izuku to bat her away like a fly, her midsection splatting into a wave of gore and viscera. The two halves of her body hit the ground as they tumbled, the girl gasping in pain. And then, not even a second later, they reconnected and regenerated, making the brown-haired teen's eyes widen even further. The brunette felt her waist, 
her eyes frantically looking at Izuku to herself, then back to Izuku, who scoffed. As is obvious, you aren't human anymore. You were dead when I turned you, and there's no going back. To put it simply, you're a demon now. Demons cannot eat regular food, raw or otherwise. So guess what you have to eat? Izuku said, gesturing to the three corpses. And no, no. The brunette shouted, glaring at Izuku, who shook her head. You're still denying it? Or are you simply refusing to understand? Either way, you must come to grips with yourself and your new reality. Either that, or you can die of starvation. Either benefits me. Besides, who's going to believe you? Especially with the police coming. You better start disposing of the evidence before you end up getting arrested. And with that, police sirens could be faintly heard in the distance, signaling to Izuku that it was time to leave. Clock's ticking. Izuku said in a sing-song tone before jumping backward toward one of the warehouse windows, before then shattering it and leaving the newly created demon in the dust. And as she left, she transformed back into her male form, Izuku breathing a sigh of relief as he felt his body return to normal. When he landed on a nearby rooftop, he watched as several police cars surrounded the warehouse. From the distance, Izuku watched as the newly created demon left through the back and ran in the opposite direction through an alleyway. Izuku smirked, crossing his arms. Whether she ate the remains didn't matter to him or not. What mattered was that he now had a second demon to rely on, meaning that Ito wasn't the only person he had to rely on. That being said, it was troublesome how she seemed to be against him, and that she still retained a hint of her humanity. There was a stark difference between Ito and this new demon. Ito was loyal to him instantly, but this new demon? She wasn't. In fact, it would be a rather obvious observation to assume that she hated him. Even still, Izuku didn't mind that. It just meant that turning her into a loyal subordinate would be more exciting. It would have been boring if every demon was instantly loyal to him. Not only that, but it also meant that he could turn people who were dead into demons. Which also meant that he could bring Natsumi back from the dead. That, after all these years, he could see the face of his first and only true friend once again. Taking off his name tag, he erased the name of Izumi Sugiyama and replaced it with Musen Kibutsuji. Now, who was that voice in my head from earlier? Izuku thought, biting the inside of his lip in thought. Shaking his head slightly, he sighed. Best to think of this at home. I'm sure the manager wouldn't mind if I took the rest of the day off. Not that I care if I'm fired. Now that I can change my form, I could easily. An idea came to the forefront of his mind. He could change his form. Meaning he could take on several different identities. Which meant? Maybe, hmm, not a hero, no. I would get caught quicker than you could say bingo at a bingo tournament. But, general studies at Udata. That can't be too hard, right? Just apply for the general studies course, ace the exam, and then I can get some small insight into the workings of UA. Not only that, but if I have to, I can always interact with those in the hero course. Izuku turned away from the warehouse, putting both hands into his pockets. Let's not be too hasty. Keep to the current plans. I'll only do that if I see a need to. Besides, Nidzu is one of the smartest creatures alive. If anyone would catch on to the dip of the deaths caused by the hero cannibal, it would be him. And if it was because of my enrollment at UA, he'd immediately suspect me. Doing that would be assisted suicide with extra steps. Jumping down from the alleyway below without so much as a sound being made, Izuka glanced over to his right, a homeless man who was beating on the corpse of a dead dog, a recently killed dog if his senses were correct, looked at him with abject fear on his visage. A feeling of hunger washed over him as Izuku smirked, a tendril seeping out of his back. Oh, why not? A little snack couldn't hurt, right? The homeless man screamed, and then there was silence. Yushiro slammed his fist against the wall of his manor, located on the outskirts of the Saitama region of Japan. He couldn't believe that this was happening, and yet, 
here was staring him in the face. All the hard work he and his allies of yore were spat on by everyone forgetting that the demons existed, something he already couldn't stand, but now, now it was as if the world was taking a piss on their graves. A new demon king arose. Someone, somewhere, came across a blue spider lily and ate it, becoming the next progenitor. Not only that, but despite the clear proof staring that worthless detective in the face, he refused to accept it. Not only that, but he even called Yashiro a quack. A fucking quack? The painter calmed himself, taking in a deep breath and letting out a small shuddering breath. Shachamra looked at him with a confused yet somehow worried expression as the cat tilted her head. Instinctively, Yashiro scratched behind her ear, making the cat purr. It's happening again, you know that? Can you feel it? The change? I know I did. That rippling feeling in my blood. It started to boil when I got the sensation that someone, somewhere, got turned into a demon. Yushiro asked the cat, who purred again, hopping down from the counter she had been standing on. Don't give me that snark. Yushiro growled as the cat flicked her ear at him, making Yushiro groan. You're a real piece of work, you know that cha-cha? All the cat did in response was swat a vase down with her tail, making Ishiro's left eye twitch. The vase bounced off of the ground and returned to its spot, seeing as it had a talisman on the front of it that made it bouncy. In fact, all of the vases and fragile pieces of equipment did, seeing as Shichamaru loved to knock things over when she got in a pissy attitude. Yushiro frowned, leaning against the wall. Many things came to his mind all at once, but one had been more prevalent than any other at this particular moment and time. The breathing techniques of the Ashira. He had recorded down all the breathing techniques the demon slayers used over the years so that they never would be forgotten. It was the first thing he did when the demon slayer corps was disbanded. Of course, a few of the former Ashira felt a little insulted that a demon was the one who was recording down their breathing techniques, but as far as Yashiro could have cared, they could kiss his ass and thank him for recording them. Of course, they were dead now, so that wasn't possible, but the point still stood. Whenever he got bored with painting, he would practice total concentration breathing, which was the first step in learning a breath. He found it peaceful, and the only thing he could find himself doing with no one but his cat to talk to. He was under the belief that he could never, ever learn a breathing technique, and yet, thanks to Tanjiro giving him his Nikarin blade before he passed away, he found that he was most compatible with water breathing. It was funny, seeing his water breathing was the most common form of breathing style, and the easiest to learn, yet the hardest to master. It only took him 20 years to fully master the technique when going at a rather casual pace, and mixed with his blood demon art, he was quite the destructive powerhouse. Yet, he never had a reason to use either. But now, now with a progenitor demon running around and possibly turning people into demons, he now had a solid reason for using his technique and blood demon art in combat. It also gave him a reason to recreate the demon slayer core. Of course, that was only if this problem got out of hand. Yushiro looked up at the Nichiren blade hanging over his doorway and frowned. He was going to need to find Scarlet Ore and Scarlet or Sand if he was going to forge more Nichiren blades. And he knew someone who knew of where to find them. As much as he hated to interact with him, the descendant of Ju Tomioko was another person who had access to a Nichiren blade and actively practiced breathing techniques. He hadn't contacted the man in quite some time. But, if there was anyone who would be willing to listen to him, it would be him. Furrowing his brow, he looked over to Shichamaru and sighed. Cha-cha, I need you to deliver this letter to someone. Shichamaru looked over at him with a tilted head. Yushiro gripped the letter in his hand with an annoyed expression. He had written it over 100 years ago, if the demons came back, he was going to contact those who were the descendants of the Ashira. It was a calling card for them to all gather in one place so he could teach them of their honored past. Unfortunately, only a handful remained, as most of their bloodlines had been destroyed because of the Quirk Awakening, the genocides, and the wars that resulted from it. He had no idea as to where the others remained, though he had to assume they were in hiding. However, he did know the location of where one of them had been. It was unfortunate, though, 
that he turned out to be a bad seed. Even still, he had a duty to perform, whether he liked it or not. Shichemaru delivered this letter to Kaizom Akaguro, the last descendant of former water and shira Ju Tomioka. When Izuku entered his apartment, he let out a small sigh. He had to admit, he felt kind of bloated. Not because he had eaten too much, but because that abusive homeless guy was just that fat. The guy was at least 250 pounds of pure fat and less muscle, meaning that it was the equivalent of eating an entire greasy fast food menu for him. That being said, he wouldn't deny that it tasted good. Still, he had more pressing matters to deal with, key of which being the voice in his head he heard not too long ago. He had never once heard that voice before, at least, ever in his waking moments. The times he did sleep, which was few and far between, he would occasionally hear a voice similar to what he heard before, though far quieter. The one notable time he heard it was when he was deciding on an alias for himself. It was extremely uncommon for him to hear that voice, so for it to make an appearance at the warehouse meant that it had to be important. Not only that, but for whatever reason, it wasn't communicating with him anymore, at least, whilst he was awake. So, that meant, for him to figure out who or what it was that was talking to him, he was going to have to close his eyes and sleep. And so, that was exactly what he planned to do. Sitting down on the couch in his living room, he closed his eyes and leaned back. The next thing he knew, he was greeted with a dark void. There was nothing in the void, nothing but swirls of white and dark black fixtures with a spiraling yellow circle dead set in front of him. But that wasn't what he was paying attention to. While the void looked, well, less like a void and more or less something ripped out of a space odyssey, Izuku was focused on the strange red light floating just a few inches in front of him. It was small, maybe about the same size as his hand, and it had red sparks flying off of it, almost like a pixie from Peter Pan. Aside from that, it had no real defining features. It simply looked like a glowing circle, and that was about it. And then, most bizarrely of all, it spoke. I see, so this is my reincarnation. How interesting. Izuku had the orb of light with a raised eyebrow. Reincarnation? I'm sorry, but I don't follow. Are you perhaps the voice I've heard in my head? Izuku asked, to which the orb fluttered around his head, then around his body, before then moving back to being in front of him, then moving a few feet away. Yes, that would be correct, Midori Izuku, the orb said, bobbing up and down, before then flickering. The orb sighed, zipping in a circle before landing on the ground. I do not have much time. I only have around three minutes, total, to interact with you. Technically speaking, I'm not even supposed to be here. I should be erased from existence, seeing as a majority of my soul lingers within your form. Something must have occurred for even a fraction of me to remain existent. So, I will cut the chit-chat and get straight to the point. The orb continued before something strange happened. The orb shone a bright light, and then it took the form of someone. The person in question was easily a foot taller than Izuku, with slick back black hair, familiar red eyes, and pale skin. He wore a white shirt, with black suspended jeans, as well as a black and red striped tie dangling from the collar of his shirt. An air of regality wafted around the man, almost as if Izuku was staring at a king. I am Musen Kibutsuji, the man whom you are the reincarnation of, and the former king of all demon kind. You are what's left of my soul, given and shaped into a new form. As a result, you are the next generation of the demons, seeing as you are a progenitor, Musen stated, arms crossed as Izuku listened with rapt attention. Regarding your abilities, you share all of them with me, and all of which you are aware of, minus a few. The ones you are aware of are your bone whips, the ability that allows you to turn humans into demons, so long as they survive the process of being able to handle your blood and the transmutation that occurs when bonding with it and the ability to shapeshift into any form you desire. Musen paused, adjusting his stance to a more neutral one, before then continuing. The abilities you are not aware of, at least up until now, are as follows. The ability to swap between your dormant form, which is the form you are in now, and your attack form, which I have reason to believe will appear different from my own. 
the ability to communicate with the demons you create from long distances, as well as manipulate the blood within their bodies to damage them if they go too far out of line, and the ability to inflict a curse upon those who say your last name so long as they have your blood in you. It was at this point that Musin began to rub at his chin, a curious expression on his face as he spoke. Surprisingly, another form of power lurks within you. If I were to guess, it might be other abilities that your body has developed. In my case, I was never able to develop any such abilities due to my body never being complete. You, on the other hand, with your immunity to the sun, seem to be able to develop new abilities over time. I'd say I look forward to seeing them, but I doubt I'll be able to. I only have 30 seconds left before this part of me disappears into the ethos. As Musin said this, his ethereal body began to dissolve. He frowned, looking at Izuku before smirking, a prideful gleam in his eyes as he spoke what Izuku had to assume would be the only words he'd ever speak again. Do not forget, boy. You are an apex predator, the strongest creature to ever breathe air on this fine earth. Nothing can stand in your way. Create more demons, push humanity into the box they were never supposed to leave, and rule the world. Make the world rue the day they forgot about demon kind. And with that, Musin vanished from thin air, and Izuku woke up with a jolt, his body lurching forward as he gasped. New abilities? Long-ranged communication? Progenitor demon? Demon kind? Name curses? Strongest creature? He knew he wasn't human, but a demon? That seemed reasonable, now that he thought about it. Demons were man-eating creatures once thought to be of myth and legend. But he was a living, breathing example of that statement to be false. And if there was a previous demon king before him, that being this musing person he took the name of as his alias, then that meant that the demons truly did exist in the past and that it was his duty to make sure the world, specifically humanity, to make sure that they would never forget about the demons ever again. Izuku smiled. There was one thing that Musin mentioned that he was able to do that he never tried before. That being long-ranged communication and torture. And seeing as he had a rogue demon named Ochako Uraraka, who seemed to have an unreasonable hatred levied toward him, he decided to test out this new trick of his. Narrowing his eyes, he took a deep breath and channeled the demon's name in the back of his mind. His face began to tingle, and then, a sharp pain reverberated in the back of his mind, almost as if a plug had been plugged into an outlet, and the connection to Ochako Uraraka had been the plug-in. His smile turned to a grin as he cracked his neck. Time to test out his new toy. Sitting underneath a tree in Yuzutafu National Park, Ochako Uraraka's body shook with rage once unknown to her. In that rage was confusion, sorrow, and regret. Confusion because her body had undergone a complete transformation into something that was not human. Sorrow because she could never face her family again now that she was turned into this, this hideous monster and regret for eating those corpses. And the worst part? They were the best things she had ever eaten since her mom's homemade machi. Her fingers, no, her claws dug into the ground effortlessly as tears trickled down her cheeks. She was paler than she was before, and her eyes were different. The whites of her eyes were pink, and her pupils remained brown, which she guessed was somewhat comforting, but the rest of her body had changed. Well, internally, at least. On the outside, she looked the same as before, minus the whole paler skin thing. In reality, she was sure her parents wouldn't have minded the change, but it was the principle of things, damn it. What would they do when they saw her eyes? Maybe they'd think them to be fake contacts? Even so, when they found out otherwise, they'd be horrified. Or maybe they wouldn't react that way? Honestly, she had no clue until she faced them. That was the thing, though. She didn't want to face them. It was bad enough that she could no longer eat her mom's homemade machi, at least according to Izumi Sugiyama, the hero cannibal, which by the way she was not expecting to be a teenage girl who looked pretty to boot, but that was neither here nor there. The point was that she changed, and not for the better. Air, well, technically she was resurrected, which made it even worse, but again that wasn't the point. She felt violated, and there was nothing she could do about it. 
The hero cannibal changed her, and there was nothing she could do about it. She couldn't even fight back against the teen, seeing as she was leagues stronger than her, and outsped her by a country mile. Literally. When she blinked after lunging at her, Wachako found herself cut in two faster than she could say holy shit. And then came the fact that she was forced to be a cannibal. A freaking cannibal. Not a carnivore, but a cannibal. She didn't want to eat people. That was wrong. Not only that, but it would make her a hypocrite if she started to eat other people, especially after calling Izumi the monster. That was when it hit her. Ochako jumped up from her seat underneath the tree, a wide smile on her face as a rush of adrenaline filled her veins. She had the hero cannibal's name. She could report her identity to the police. She could get the hero cannibal arrested. She could. Don't get ahead of yourself, Ochako Urarika. A pulsing pain ran throughout Ochako's head as she came crashing down to her knees, gripping the sides of her head in pure agony. The voice inside her head sounded an awful lot like Izumi's, though a bit more masculine than before. Erg. What? What the hell? Ochako groaned, bending over as her elbows touched the ground. Did you really think I would let you know my true name and appearance? That's funny. Really funny. The voice admonished as it hummed thoughtfully. You know this is the first time I'm doing this, telepathically communicating with my thralls, that is. And it's all thanks to a little helper, shall I say, that I'm now aware of this ability. And I plan to use it to its fullest extent. The voice said, a laughing following after its speech. Let me let you in on a little tidbit of information you should know, just for future reference. You will listen and obey every command I give you. Because if you don't, well... There was a pause. And then, Ochako's right arm exploded into a river of blood and pain unlike any other that she had experienced before, a bellowing scream leaving the girl as she cried tears of unrivaled pain and distress. She fell to her side, sobbing uncontrollably as her arm slowly began to regenerate back from the stub that it was left in. That is only one iota of the pain that you will suffer if you backstab me. I will not hesitate to kill you myself if you fall out of line. The voice stated, its tone unforgiving as the brunette could finally feel her other hand. Be that as it may, I am anything but unforgiving. I will not hesitate to reward you if you prove to be a faithful thrall. After all, you are an apex predator, now. Stronger than everyone around you. All you have to do is kill and devour those pathetic weaklings that walk amongst you. And if the idea of killing the innocent sickens you, why not solely target fake heroes and villains? The people you eat do not matter to me. All that matters is that you become stronger. If you fail to do that, then I will eliminate you myself. Are we clear? Ochako wiped the tears away from her eyes as best she could, slowly and shakily standing up. A pit deeper than the Marianas Trench formed in her stomach at the realization of just how powerless she was in this situation. And upon that realization, she found an understanding. For the time being, she chose to believe the voice. She chose to listen to the voice. But the moment she got stronger than the voice, it was game over for them. I understand, Ochako whispered as the voice chuckled. Good. I hope our next in-person meeting does not go the same way as it did before, Ochako Urarika. Farewell. And with that, the voice disappeared, and along with it her headache. She clenched her regrown hand multiple times, looking down at it with a hint of disbelief. She couldn't believe that this was what she was able to do. Regenerate lost limbs seemed like something pulled out of an urban fantasy. Even the most potent of regeneration quirks couldn't regenerate a lost limb. Maybe a finger, or perhaps even a hand, but never a full limb without severe consequences. In that aspect, she was practically unkillable. Then, an idea wormed its way into her head. I can't become a hero my ass. The voice was right, as long as I only target villains, and keep it discreet enough, I can continue my dream and become the hero that I told mom and dad that I would become. Yue, here I come. Ochako thought, about to head out of the forest, 
when a thought came to her. Wait a minute, what about my quirk? If her body changed, then did that mean her quirk did too? Because if that was the case, then that would mean she'd need to test it out, and seeing as she was in the middle of a forest, she could test it out without having to worry about anyone reporting her for illegal quirk usage. And so, true to form, Ochako walked over to a rock she saw off in the distance. She placed her right hand with all five fingers on the rock, a bright pink glow omitted around the rock, and then it began to float just a little bit off of the ground. Raising an eyebrow, she looked at the rock with curiosity. Her quirk, gravity, allowed her to remove the gravity of an object causing it to float upward. But right now, the rock wasn't moving past the height of her hand. Which confused her. That wasn't how her quirk worked. Moving her hand behind her head, just before she scratched the back of her neck, the rock moved up to the level of where her hand would have been. And that was when she realized something. The rock moved around when her hand moved around. She did remove its gravity, just like her quirk was supposed to do. But she could move it around with her hand. Meaning, she had complete control over what she touched, so long as she removed the gravity of it. That kind of control was something she wished she had before. And now, she had it. The best part? She didn't even feel nauseous. In other words, her quirk no longer had the weaknesses that were plaguing it before. Balling her hand into a fist to do a celebratory jump, she was about to declare her triumph, only for the rock to shatter into a million little pieces. Well, not a million, per se, but into small chunks. Her eyes widened at that as she looked at her hands, then back to the remains of the rock. She just crushed that rock without even trying. No, actually, that wasn't it. She felt a weight being applied to the rock when she did that. The air felt thicker. She even noticed that bits of grass were moving upward toward the rock as she balled her hand into the fist. And then, a realization hit her like a speeding train. She didn't crush it. She added gravity to it. Her quirk had evolved. Not only had it evolved, but it had also changed fundamentally. And it had something to do with the hero cannibal. She didn't know why she thought that to be the case, but she did. It was all too much of a coincidence for it to be not. First, they resurrected her as some sort of monster. She gained the ability to regenerate, and her quirk had somehow changed. And then, an idea formed in her head. They had resurrected her, amped up her power, and made her far more formidable. Not only was she far more formidable, but she felt a million times stronger than she was before. She wasn't human anymore, which was what the hero cannibal had said. She was on a whole other level compared to everyone around her, and because of that, nothing short of another being like her could touch her. If she became a hero, she'd be incredibly successful in her own right. All she had to do was listen to whatever the hero cannibal wanted her to do, and she'd be able to stay alive. She could continue her dream toward being a hero, and make the hero cannibal happy all at the same time. Now her only hang-up was her parents and her current schooling situation. However, that decision was quickly made up. She was going to finish her school year and explain to her parents what happened. And when she did that, she would attempt the UA entrance exam. But before she could do anything else, her stomach growled at her. She was hungry. There was a rustling in the bushes, and her head snapped over to its direction. A little kid ran out of the bushes, followed by several other children, two more to be exact, totaling three kids. They were wearing bright clothing, probably so they didn't get lost. Her expression dropped, her eyes narrowed, and all thoughts went out the window. The only thing on her mind was food. The kids all looked at her, and at that moment, she saw their fear. The rational side of her screamed at herself, telling her to go and find something else, but a more feral side to her, a stronger side of her, took control at that moment and barred her teeth in a wicked, cruel smile. A series of screams. And then... Silence. At Mizutafu Private School, Mikan leaned up against the locker, scrolling through her phone as she read the latest news article. Last night, three corpses belonging to three yet unidentified children were found within Nizutafu National Park, all partially devoured. 
It seemed as if the hero cannibal had moved past eating fake heroes and moved on to eating civilians now, at least, according to the headline on The Guardian. She wasn't going to lie, she was sort of a fan of the hero cannibal. She kind of found their work to be far better than that of the hero killer, because unlike the hero killer, the hero cannibal went after real fake heroes. Now, granted, killing was never an option, but she found a distinct satisfaction when reading up on the hero cannibal's latest victim being killed. What could she say? Pedophiles and abusers deserved what they got, and if that meant having their faces ripped off and their bodies desecrated, then so be it. However, it seemed that as of late, fake heroes weren't the only things on the menu anymore. Civilians were now, too which meant that he was no longer just the hero cannibal but a crazed lunatic to the broader public. Of course, there was also the possibility that posers were running about trying to make the hero cannibal look like a monster. Hell, in a rare event, the hero cannibal themselves, using what she could only assume was a burner phone, even cleared up the confusion on Twitter, saying that these were imitators and that they had nothing to do with the children's corpses. They even vowed to find whoever did it, and do unto them what they did unto those children as they worded it. Of course, the tweet was deleted by Twitter themselves, but for fans like herself, that was more than enough to believe the hero cannibal's innocence for the lack of a better word. However, on a more home front issue, her father was beyond annoyed by the stunt the hero cannibal pulled. They tracked the burner phone's location, only to find it destroyed in the middle of a clearing in a forest miles away from the city. They had been prepared to bring them in, to finally catch the elusive S-Class villain, even bringing a couple of top pro heroes like Ryukyu and Hawks to catch the bastard, only to find a broken cell phone and a written note saying, you'd think it would be that easy? To add salt to the wound, there was a smiley face drawn in the corner. Her father wouldn't stop talking about it at dinner last night, and to say that everyone was a bit annoyed about it was an understatement. However, the frustration was warranted. The public was whipped up into a frenzy over the last month and a half. Heroes kept dropping like flies, said heroes being revealed to be pedophilic monsters after their deaths, corpses that appeared to be eaten kept popping up, and neither the police nor the pro-heroes had been able to get a feeling as to what the villain responsible even looked like. Some people were still vocally asking to know what happened to the Midorias, seeing as that it was around that time when the hero cannibal cases started up. That got some crazy people to speculate that the missing son of Inko Midoriya might have been responsible for the deaths. However, due to him being dubbed as a missing person, and also considered dead, the police didn't bother to look into it, even if it did seem reasonable to assume. Of course, usually, they would consider that. However, seeing as at the time of their deaths, Midoriya Izuku had pissed off a local gang and had apparently been being followed around the city at the time according to some eyewitnesses. So, the idea of him being even remotely responsible for what happened and or being linked to the hero cannibal seemed outlandish. Chances were that he was abducted by the mob and put into a human trafficking ring, at which point there was nothing else that could be done about it. Still, though, it was a reasonable conclusion, and if she ever got to meet the hero cannibal, that would definitely be a question she'd ask. Public opinion in Heroes was beginning to wane ever so slightly, though a lot of people were under the belief that if the hero killer did make themselves known, All Might would be able to defeat him. Tsukachi-san Mikan looked up from her phone to see one of her classmates, Reiko Yanagi, walking up to her with a small, barely noticeable smile on her face. She had her arms just barely in front of her like she always did, her chin-length silver hair covering one of her eyes as per usual, and her near-emotionless eyes, minus the small spark that lit up upon seeing her, looked as charming as they always did. Both were adorned in the school's uniform, that being a white shirt, black tie, and blue knee-high skirt with black stockings, and both as far as Mikan was concerned rocked it. Ah, uh, Yanagi-chan, how are you this morning? Mikan asked, turning around to put her phone away in her locker. Reiko, for her part, clasped her hands together with as bright of a smile as she could manage. I'm doing great, thank you. What about you, though? We're supposed to have a new student in our class today, and I for one am excited. I heard he was cute, Reiko said as Mikan raised an eyebrow, finally opening her locker as she slipped her phone inside. 
You actually care about that gossip crap, Yanagi-chan? And here I thought you were above that, Mikan snarked as Reiko's cheeks flushed red. H.A. L. Look, just because I don't care for the casual jock talk from the usual circle jerks doesn't mean I don't keep my ears open for something I do care about, Reiko said as Mikan giggled. The bell chimed as Mikan closed the door to her locker, snapping the lock shut as the pair made their way to their classroom. The classroom was your atypical classroom, for rows of five desks, a blackboard, a place for teachers to stand and teach the class, and shelves with textbooks in the back of the room. Mikan sat at the back of the classroom, whereas Reiko sat more toward the front of the class, though this was due to the seating arrangement rather than what the two friends wanted. It didn't take long for everyone else to trickle in, and for the teacher, Mr. Yatsuhashi, to walk into the classroom. Dressed in a black and white plaid shirt, red jeans, and a pair of glasses, the gorilla-appearing mutant-type quirk user stood at the front of the class with a smile on his face. As was apparent, Takeo Yatsuhashi's quirk was gorilla, giving him the appearance of a gorilla with all of the strengths of a gorilla. Good morning, class. Mr. Yatsuhashi said, clearing his throat as a sea of good mornings came from the class. With a quick nod, Mr. Yatsuhashi continued. Now, I'm sure you've heard that we are getting a new student, which is unusual seeing as we are halfway through the semester. However, this student has shown a great deal of talent, so I would like you all to welcome him, Mr. Yatsuhashi said as the sliding door to the classroom opened and in stepped someone that Mikan recognized immediately. The boy was of average height, with green and black hair, red eyes, and a pale complexion. He was wearing the school's male uniform, that being the white shirt, black tie, and black jeans with black shoes, and his hair was slicked back with just a single hair over his forehead. When the teen walked up to the front of the class, a myriad of whispers made their way around the classroom, though they abruptly stopped when Mr. Yatsuhashi coughed into his hand. Settle down, class. Settle down. Now, would you kindly introduce yourself to the class? The teacher asked the teen, who nodded. My name is Kibutsuji Musen, the boy said, bowing. Please take care of me, Musen said as he stood up. Everyone remained silent, but a lot of eyes were already on him, mostly from the female crowd and some from the male crowd. One of those sets of eyes belonged to Mikan, flabbergasted at seeing him at her school. Thank you, Kibutsuji Kuen. We have an extra seat prepared for you behind Tsukachi-san, Mr. Yatsuhashi said as Musen walked to the back of the class, but not before flashing Mikan a smile as he took his seat behind her. Mikan felt a small blush creep its way onto her cheeks upon seeing him again, but was brought out of her thoughts once classes began. The day turned out as normally as it usually did, and when the bell rang for lunch, Mikan stood up from her chair and spun around to see Musen, who was smiling at her with an innocent look in his eyes. Hello, Tsukachi-san. How are you doing? The teen asked as Mikan huffed. Are you seriously in my class? Mikan said an annoyed look in her eyes as Musen raised an eyebrow. Uh, I do not see why this is an issue. I mean, what's the problem? Also, your cheeks are a little red. Are you okay? Musen asked as Mikan covered the lower half of her face, turning away to look at the window. And never mind. Mikan muttered. Ha, Tsukachi-san, you know Kibutsuji Kuen? The sudden voice of Reiko caught Mikan off guard, and she jumped back in surprise. Reiko had a curious look in her eyes, all the while Musen smiled. I saved her life from a pervert a month ago. I had just moved into the area and was getting some groceries when I heard her scream for help. So, I came to her rescue. She was already unconscious by the time I got there, so I took her to Mizutafu National Park. I walked her home, and that was the end of our meeting. After that, she popped by the McDonald's I work at a handful of times. That's about the extent we know about each other. A shocked expression made itself apparent on Reiko's face before looking over to Mikan. Is that true, Tsukachi-san? You were almost, uh... Why, yes. And I don't want to talk about it, Mikan snapped, making Reiko flinch. The brunette sighed, collecting herself as she looked at Musen with a small smile on her face. 
and I'm still thankful for what you did that night. So, once again, thank you. My dad's been meaning to ask you to come over for dinner, but he's been rather busy. Musin waved his hand dismissively. Ah, thank you for the offer. I already have plans tonight. I'm visiting someone who I haven't seen in a rather long time. Tell your father that I am thankful for the invitation, but that I'll pass, Musin said, humming in thought for a moment, before then asking a question. Say, your father is obviously Naomi Tsukachi, correct? So, I wonder, what is your quirk? It's not a lie detector quirk, so you probably have something similar to your mother's quirk, right? Mikan sighed, rubbing the back of her neck with an anxious look on her face. I, um, I don't have a quirk, Mikan said, making Musin's eyes widen. At the sight of that, she quickly retraced her steps. I, I mean, I don't have the toe joint, so that means I'm bound to awaken one at some point, but it just hasn't shown up yet. Mikan said as Musin's eyes gleamed with sympathy. I see. Does anyone give you grief over it? Musin asked as Mikan shook her head. Not anymore. Not after my dad came to the school and did a presentation on quirkless discrimination and what the repercussions of committing that crime entail. But, but I'm not quirkless, damn it. I know I have a quirk. The toe x-ray is a flawless way of checking if someone has a quirk or not. So, so I have to have a quirk. Mikan said, her eyes almost watery. She didn't see it, but an almost predatory gleam appeared in Musin's eye for half a second before he placed a hand on her shoulder. Mikan looked at Musin, his red eyes gleaming in the light as he smiled. The way the light shone down on him like some sort of angel, the way his hair sat on his head as their eyes met, and the way he stood with his hand on her shoulder caused butterflies to make their way to her stomach. It's all right, Tsukachi-san. It doesn't matter what you are, I won't think less of you no matter if you have a quirk or not, Musin said, letting go of her shoulder as he put his hands in his pants pockets, his shoulders relaxed as he looked over at the time. Well, I'm going to go for a walk. I ate before class before you asked. I'll catch you all later. And with that, Musin left the classroom to go on a walk. And it was when he left that a realization washed over Mekon like a tidal wave. She had a crush on the new kid. She had a crush on Musin Kibutsuji. And thus, once more, filth has been purged, stained, otherwise known to the very few who know the real him, Kaizo Makaguro, said as he wiped his steel-bladed katana free of the filthy blood of yet another fake pro hero. His duty was now fulfilled, and the idea of tainted, false hero trash and their disgusting blood tainting his blade for longer than it had to, sickened him. Strange, seeing as he killed fake heroes for practically a living, but that was neither here nor there. Stain was tall, around 180 centimeters to be precise, kid out in a black combat suit, plated with metal armor across his body which was meant to holster every single one of his many, many blades. The combat suit was sleeveless, which exposed his rather beefy arms, which were wrapped up in bandages to appear more creepy. On his wrists were a couple of wristbands, and on his left arm was a watch, which was used to track the time his quirk, blood curdle, paralyzed his targets for. His knees and elbows were protected by metal plates so that no one could get a cheap shot on him when he wasn't fully paying attention. For footwear, he wore a pair of black boots with spiked toes and sides, so that if he kicked someone, he could stab them and make them bleed. Around his upper face, he wore a white tattered cloth to cover up his disfigured nose and upper portion of his face. Sheeting his blade, he began to walk out of the alleyway, his job completed when he heard a meowing sound come from behind him. Looking over his shoulder, he saw a small orange, black and white cat that he recognized. His eyes widened upon seeing it and knelt down so it would walk up to him. Maruchan, how did you find me? Kaizom asked the cat, only for it to purr and rub fondly at his leg. Maruchan was a cat that he met a few years back, a stray that took a liking to him. Well, it wasn't a stray, it in fact had an owner, but who could fault him for thinking it a stray by the way it looked at the time? Curiously, in its mouth was a letter. Maruchan passed him the letter, to which he opened it after seeing that it was addressed to him. Not staying but to Kaizo Makaguro. 
The letter read as follows. Dear akaguro kuin I hope this letter finds you well. I've sent Shichamaru to give you this letter, as this is of utmost importance. I will tell you more through this letter. However, if it gets intercepted by someone, I do not want anyone to find out who or what this was about. I've already risked enough by putting your name on the damn thing. The last thing I want is for more people to know who sent it. For this purpose, I will be leaving my name absent, though I'm sure you know exactly who it is who is writing you. I am aware that you are currently in Hakido, but as I said, this is of the utmost importance. I need you to be in Hosu by March 23rd at the local pub. I've rented it out completely for that day, and I expect you to be there. As much as it pains me to work with you, what with the controversy behind you, as you are the descendant of Jutomioka, the former water and shearer of the Demon Slayer Corps, I wish to speak with you and whomever else I can get into contact with who are former descendants of the Ashira. As we speak, something major is going down. Something that the rest of the world cannot know about for the time being, not until my fears have been confirmed without a shadow of a doubt. So, please, heed my call. Until we meet in person. Signed, a close friend. When he finished reading the letter, he ruffled the head of Shichamaru and frowned, placing the letter in his pocket. A part of him wanted to spite Yashiro, but he knew that the green-haired painter would travel the ends of the country to find him, because he always did, no matter how far he traveled, the bastard would find him, so seeing how that would be fruitless, he decided to heed the man's words. The only reason he would have to message me would be if it truly was important. The meet-up date is also extremely specific, that being the day we met all those years ago. As Kaizom thought this, Maruchan began to leave. He watched the cat leave, and when it did, Kaizom began his escape. He now had a date to look forward to, and seeing as it was only a week away, Kaizom would have to finish up his work quickly in Hakido. He only had two more targets anyway so it wouldn't take him long. Although, there was something about that letter that made him raise an eyebrow. That being the invoking of his long-dead ancestor, Jew. How would Yashiro know of his ancestor, Jew? Not many people knew he was tied to him, so how exactly did Yashiro know? A question for the meeting, Kaizom thought as he scaled the rooftops of Hakido. Things have changed. Not only have things changed, but they did by a fucking landslide. At least, to Bakugo Katsuki, they had. It had been four years since Cat Eyes got expelled from Aldera for having a criminal record, however the hell that came about, and three and a half years since Auntie Inko and Cat Eyes died. Ever since then, things just hadn't been the same. Of course, when Cat Eyes got expelled, Bakugo was elated. He didn't have to deal with that creepy nerd anymore. Seriously, Cat Eyes was fucking weird. He was way too smart for Alderer's standards, and every time he tried to start shit with him, one weirdly philosophical quote later, the situation was diffused, and he would walk away as if nothing happened, even after a few explosions were pelted in his face. Still, though, at that point, he couldn't have been happier that the weirdo was gone. Sure, the school lost all of the eyes it had on it by endorsers, and not too long afterward the school fell into hard times, but that didn't stop Bakugo from continuing his attendance. If anything, that made his backstory as the number one pro hero even better. And then Cat Eyes and Auntie Inko died, and everything got worse. His mother lost her flair, and his dad became a workaholic at the fashion company he worked at, rarely ever coming home until the wee hours of the morning, and then immediately downing two or three cans of beer after that, before going to bed. His mom's and dad's marriage was in shambles, and they argued almost every fucking night. He tried his best to ignore it, really, he did. But it was starting to get to him. Even the almighty Bakugo Katsuki had his limits. His mother and father's constant arguing was one of them. So, he spent less time at home and more time at the arcade. And then the hero cannibal showed up, and by fucking god it was awful. In the span of four years, 96 pro heroes were murdered and devoured by this fucking creepazoid, and his mother became extremely paranoid, enforcing a curfew on him that if he didn't keep up with she would deny him the ability to apply for UA, which, if she did, would fuck up his entire way of life. So, begrudgingly, he followed it. 
and currently, his curfew was coming up, that being 8.25 p.m. It was 7.55, and the walk took about five minutes from the arcade to home. He didn't want to worry his mom, at least not as much as she already was. Some people would say that he didn't care about his parents, and while on the surface that might have seemed like the case, in reality, he did. He really did. Hell, he wouldn't be acting out the way he was if he didn't. And besides, Auntie Inko's death didn't just affect him, it affected him, too. Ever since her death, he had calmed down a hell of a lot more than he used to. He toned down on the bullying, and he was less loud. He mostly kept to himself, and when he trained, he did so with the knowledge that Auntie Inko was watching him. And every time he thought of that, he thought of cat eyes, and a wave of regret would wash over him like a tidal wave. Regret for being such a malignant piece of shit toward him. He picked on him because of his stupid eyes, and he kept doing it because he just allowed it to happen. He got it in his head that it was like a greeting, then continued about his day. He didn't think much of it, but Cat Eyes probably hated his guts for it, when in reality he didn't mean anything by it. Besides, he knew Cat Eyes was hiding something else about his quirk. Why did he think that? Well, to put it simply, no one could tank all of those explosions to the face and come out of it with not a single fucking scratch or scar. He must have had some sort of regeneration quirk, and the eyes were probably just a mutation because of it. That was another reason why he kept doing it. Was it a good excuse? Hell, the fuck no it wasn't. But he kept doing it because it had become a routine. Spot cat eyes, shove him into a wall, grunt at him, then explode his face if he got snippy. Rinse and repeat. Cat eyes barely if not ever made his annoyance known, so he thought the shithead had accepted his place and kept on trucking to his next class. If he knew that a few weeks after his expulsion that he was going to die, maybe he would have visited him, and maybe he would have tried to patch up their friendship. But, as was obvious, that wasn't happening any time soon. When he walked up to the front door of his house, he glanced at the driveway and scowled. The car wasn't there, meaning that his dad, predictably, wasn't home. Fucking dickhead, bastard always makes mom worry, gets drunk, yells at her, then sleeps on the couch till 10 in the morning. He used to be better, now he's just a fucking slob. Grunting, he opened the front door and dropped his backpack in the doorway. Oi. Hag. I'm home. Bakugo shouted, taking his shoes off at the door. He looked down and raised an eyebrow. His mom's shoes were there, yes. But. The fuck? Bakugo muttered, picking up a pair of shoes he had not seen before. They were his size, so they couldn't be another adult. Then again, if his mom was cheating on his dad, he wouldn't have given less of a shit. Now, three to four years ago? Most definitely. But with the way he was acting now, you're not so much. So, question was, who the fuck did these shoes belong to? Shrugging, he dropped the shoes and entered the house properly, looking over to the kitchen. He heard the sound of talking and the sound of food being cooked. His mother was in there, obviously, but her voice sounded different. Somber, almost? No, more like a mixture of sadness and joy. But why? What would she be joyful about? Oi. Hag. I said I'm home. Bakugo called out, walking over to the kitchen doorway. He was about to say something when whatever words he was about to say died in his throat. His eyes widened to the size of saucers, his mouth agape, and his expression no longer one of concern, but one of shock, anger, and confusion. Why? Because sitting at the dinner table, hands clasped together while placed firmly on the table, red cat-like eyes staring at him with amusement, wearing a button-down white shirt with his green and black hair combed over with a piece of hair dangling over his forehead, was Izuku Midoriya. Oh? Why, hello there, Kakin. It's been a while, I guess I have some explaining to do. And after hearing his voice, Bakugo fainted out of shock. And that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the story. Please subscribe and like for more videos and support the original writer.